Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to thank the, uh, Professor Joe uh, for inviting uh, for this exciting uh, workshop. Uh, today, uh, the, actually, today I prepared the two talks, uh, but the first part will be about the molecular mechanism to filter uh, a spatier temporal noise uh, inside of the cell. Uh, I usually study uh, some rhythm in our body, so-called circadian rhythm. So circadian comes from the Latin, which means about a day. So 24-hour uh, rhythm in your body is called the circadian rhythm. For instance, your uh, sleep-wake-up cycle is one part of the circadian rhythm. So how these 24-hour rhythms are generated in our body is uh, via a transcriptional and translational negative feedback loop. So uh, there is so-called uh, period gene. Uh, when clock BML protein, activator protein binds to this period gene, period gene is uh, activated so that it triggers the expression of the period uh, mRNA. And then they are translated to the protein at the cytoplasm. So this happened about for 12 hours so that around the 12 hour, you can see that period level is keep increasing, 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 increasing. And then after 12 hours, they enter to the nucleus where they inhibit the clock and BML. So that transcription is now stopped. So that the increasing of this period is now stopped. And then now they are degrading, degrading, de degrading for 12 hours. And when it becomes now 24 hour, all the period protein is now disappear in the cell so that that inhibition is also now released. So that now we can reproduce the period of protein for 12 hours and then decay for 12 hours. That happens every day in your brain, basically. That's the uh, key mechanism for generating 24-hour rhythms in our body. And then this mechanism has been identified by these three uh, American researchers and who got Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine uh, for this negative feedback loop of the circadian clock. So this is a, a really well characterized uh, mechanism in biology, uh, but, uh, but somehow when I read this thing, I felt that this is too ideal uh, because uh, that may, uh, to generate this 24-hour rhythm, this period protein need to enter the nucleus at the same time every day, right? Every, after 12 hours, they enter to the nucleus and shut down the transcription. But, site, uh, but, cell is, uh -oh. but cell is not empty space. It's a super complex spaces. But how the thousands of the molecules enter, travel this complex environment and enter to the nucleus at the same time every day? Is it possible? Actually, not easy, right? So uh, to investigate this question, uh, uh, basically what this means is, uh, here is a New York map. Let's just say uh, different people live the, at uh, starting uh, their travel at the different position, but they travel through this old track peak jammed Manhattan Road, and then they enter, uh, arrive at the center of the Manhattan at the same time every day. Do you think it's possible? It's not an easy problem, right? So uh, to investigate this, uh, basically what we did is, uh, uh, what we did is we tagged the uh, GFP protein into per molecule and we tracked the movement of this per molecule inside of the cell. And then what we found is, so uh, this is a nucleus. What we found is, of course, their arrival time is different. Some protein, of course, arrive earlier than others. But surprising thing is, you can see this ring structure, that means they do not enter to the nucleus immediately. They are keep waiting their friends. They are keep waiting, waiting, waiting their friends. And then when all of their friends arrive, they enter to the nucleus together. Okay, so they make whole this ring structure and then suddenly they enter to the whole nucleus together. So I was curious where this uh, friendship between the molecules come from. So where this collective behavior of the molecules comes from, that's my uh, question. So that uh, for this, uh, we use the mathematical modeling approach. 
So first, uh, we use the, that agent-based uh, modeling approach. So uh, basically, uh, transcription occurs inside of nucleus, and then they are translated into the at the cytoplasm, and then they travel, and then they enter to the nucleus and sequester the uh, inhibit the transcription. That's that negative effect loop. But with the known current knowledge, what we found is. Of course, when certain protein arrive earlier to the nucleus, they just get into the nucleus earlier. There was no uh, collective behavior. That means there is something missing in that negative feedback loop. So, uh, and first, what it is known is period two, uh, when this period protein enter to the nucleus, they should be phosphorylated. That's uh, already known at the multiple site. And then a uh, previous couple of years ago, we found that uh, with the uh, Duke NUS group, this phosphorylation occurs in a cooperative manner. What I mean the cooperative manner is, first the phosphorylation is very, very slow. But as long as that slow phosphorylation occurs, the follow-up phosphorylation is very fast. So first phosphorylation triggers the uh, neighboring phosphorylation. So with this phos uh, cooperative phosphorylation, what we found is, uh, we can uh, make the switch. So what I mean the switch is, uh, let's imagine here is a cell, and then uh, let's make a very small circle in this cell. Then we can measure the local concentration of the per protein, right? So here, uh, x-axis mean is uh, local concentration in this small circle in the cell, okay? And then uh, y-axis is, in this small circle, what is the fraction of the per protein which is phosphorylated? So one means all of them are phosphorated. So what we found is when local concentration is low, majority of, the, of them are in the uh, unphosphorated status. You can see that unphosphorated status, it's maintained, maintained. But the local concentration is passing to certain thresholds. Suddenly, we found that all these unphosphorated proteins are suddenly switched to the whole uh, phosphorated status. So really, the collective behavior was possible in the locally. So when we merge this, uh, we call this is phosphor switch because this is off and on of the phosphorylation. When we merge it to that previous agent-based model, now we can finally see the uh, friendship among the molecule. So here, what I draw is here orange dot is unphosphorylated protein, and purple dot is phosphorylated protein so that they can enter to the nucleus you can see that at the beginning, they are accumulated, accumulated at the perinucleus. But around that time, the concentration of this per molecule is not high enough. So that's why they are in the orange status. So that's why there are very few of them can enter the nucleus, but more protein is accumulated so that finally they passing to this threshold. Now they, so they are suddenly switched to this purple phosphorylated protein and then they can enter to the nucleus all together. So this is the key of that collective behavior. Uh, then how to uh, in, uh, prevent or interfere this uh, uh, collective behavior is, one way is uh, introduce the obstacle. So uh, this is, let's say, normal level of the crowdedness of the cell, this uh, gray dot. But let's increase it so that cell is more and more crowded. As a result, the accumulation of this per protein at the perinucleus is not occur. As a result, you can see that the collective uh, nucleus entry does not occur. Uh, and this leads to the very weak uh, and unstable circadian rhythm compared to the uh, original circadian rhythm. So this collective nucleus entry is the key to generate this strong uh, circadian rhythm. And we wanted to uh, validate this model prediction using experiment. So how to make the cell is more overcrowded? Uh, one way is uh, using the adipocyte. Basically, we put the more uh, artificial fat inside of inside the cell. We can do it. And uh, what you can see is, uh, without that, uh, there is a normal circadian rhythm. But you can see that we put the more fat fat inside of cell circadian rhythm becomes very unstable and super long. Uh, and, and here is a key experiment. So this is normal mice. You can see that they sleep 
uh, they sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up in a very regular pattern. But this is when day and night. But even we make the dark, dark, complete darkness, you can see that they maintain beautiful sleep-wake-up cycle. Uh, but uh, when we make the obesity mice, so the cell is more crowded with uh, fat, you can see that there is a no more uh, regular sleep-wake cycle happen. And then what else can make a, a site, uh, cell is more crowded? There are various things, uh, aging, and autophagy malfunction, Alzheimer's disease are all known to increasing the uh, uh, cytoplasmic congestion level. And we found that in the mice of all these three types of the phenotype have this kind of sleep wake-up cycle pattern. And then this was mice, and then we studied a clinical study, and we found that uh, even in the human, obesity human and aging human, and Alzheimer patient, all of them had a sleep cycle problem. But the problem was, we didn't know why. But our study suggests that all of them has an unstable sleep wake cycle because their cytoplasmic congestion level is too high. So this shows a way how to treat them to reduce, uh, to make the, restore the regular sleep wake cycle. And then, uh, so, that, uh, so that we suggest that this, this new concept, the cytoplasmic, uh, cytoplasmic tract peak gem, could be the cause of the unstable uh, sleep wake cycle. So this could be a new target for the treatment of the unstable sleep cycle. So this is uh, uh, my first talk. Uh, and then uh, let me move to the, my uh, second talk. So uh, this is about uh, inferring the network structure uh, from the uh, time series data. It's a sort of reverse engineering problem. Uh, as you know, cell is complex, and actually uh, identifying the interaction between the certain molecule is not easy experimentally. It took a couple of years in the experimental lab. But nowadays, uh, due to the experimental advance, uh, measuring the concentration change of the specific molecules are uh, way easy to measure. So that the natural question is, from this uh, time series data, can we say that uh, these two molecules have any interaction? That's a very natural question. So for this, uh, various uh, inference algorithm has been used. And one of the most famous one is like a grandeur causality or convergence cross mapping thing, which is based on the predictability uh, uh, concept. Uh, but the problem is, uh, previous, uh, all, all previous inference algorithm has some common problem. Because I'm studying the circadian rhythm, so majority of the gene has a 24-hour periodic expressions. So when I plug into the 24-hour uh, same period gene expression profile, previous uh, inference algorithm say that always yes. Always the uh, causation exists because they cannot distinguish the causation and synchrony between the data set. So that, uh, that means we need uh, some new method Basically, we need uh, some new method based on the unique property of oscillatory dynamics. Uh, that's what I want to present at the remaining time. So let me begin with a very simple and famous example. Uh, it's a Fitch-Hugh-Nagumo model. It's a two-dimensional ODE model. You can see that there are four types of the uh, interaction between the V variable and W variable. So for instance, uh, W, uh, positively regulate the V because V dot has a, this positive term. So let's assume that we don't know this equation so that we don't know this regulation, but we just know their solution. By just looking at this solution, can we recover this four uh, causation type? That's my question. So one simple approach is, okay, W positively regulate the V. So maybe we can expect that as W increasing, Maybe V also increasing. That's a one naive uh, approach. But unfortunately, that does not work. Even here, W is increasing. You can see that V is decreasing, so it doesn't work. Ah, oh, right. Actually, W regulate not V, it's V dot, right? So then maybe we can say that as W increasing, uh, V dot might be increasing, right? But as W increasing, V dot decreasing. So that's not also true. And the reason is, 
the V dot is not only determined by the W, but also determined by the V term, right? So there is a masking by the V, so we cannot use this kind of approach. So that means we have to investigate the relationship between W and V. We have to remove this masking effect from the V. So how to do is very simple. Uh, when we let's pick up any time point, then we can find another time point B, uh, TV which has the same value at this V, right? Okay. Then if we compare the W value at T and TV, it should following the W. So what I mean is, uh, if we look at this two value here. Uh, w is smaller compared to here, that means this thing indicates that W dot should be smaller compared to here, right? So that uh, this can provide us some information. So based on this, uh, we uh, uh, de uh, define the regulation detection function, which means the relationship between W value and WTV and the V dot T and V dot TV. So we can imagine that if WT is larger than WTV, V dot should be larger than V dot TV, so that we can imagine that this term should be the always positive. And then if we plug in this original OD, we can prove that this is true. So that throughout all this time cycle, we can see that this uh, regulation detection function should be positive. So that we define the regulation detection score, what this means is, uh, what is a fraction of this positive area in this example at a plus one? Okay, so uh, if we extend this idea, uh, you can see that uh, here V to the W is negative regulation. In this case, this regulation detection function is always negative, so that uh, detection score is minus one. Uh, and W2, W is self-regulation is negative, so that it's always negative, so it's minus one. Uh, but what about the V to V? It's a, mix a mixture of the plus and minus terms, so that the regulation detection function consists of blue and red parts, so that its value is between the minus one and one. So this provides a very simple criteria. If there is a plus regulation, this regulation detection score should be plus one. And then minus regulation is minus one. And then it's a mixture, it's a plus and minus one between value. And then we apply our method to this simple experimental data between the pre and, uh, prey and predator population data. And here is a, a calculated uh, regulation detection function. Uh, P to D, if we bring the P to D data, uh, the regulation detection function is plus one, that makes sense because this is food and this is a, a data, so that this should be a plus regulation, and opposite is minus one. And self-regulation is between the minus one and one because uh, current our population uh, has both plus and minus regulation because birth rate and death rate depending on uh, current initial population. So this uh, indeed algorithm works even in real experimental data, so that we want to use uh, for the really inference of the actual network inside of the cell. So uh, basically, uh, we made a two assumption. Inside of the cell, when X protein regulate the Y protein, we assume that it's monotonic. What I mean is, X regulate the Y either in positive or negative way, but not the mixture. That's one assumption. And second, I assume that self-regulation is negative. The reason is, uh, inside of cell, protein degradation is proportional to the current population uh, concentration so that we can assume the self is negative. So by merging these two, I made a three rules. If x to the y is plus one, y to the y is negative one, so self-regulation is minus, then we can say that indeed x to the y has positive regulation. And x to the y is minus one, and y to the y is minus one, we can say that it's negative regulation. But except for these two, all other value, we can say that there is no causation. So let's apply this three rule to the, this uh, simulated data set. So uh, for instance, m to the p, uh, the value is one and 0.8, so that there is no causation. Uh, 
uh, m to pc plus 1 and minus 1 so that we can say that there is a positive regulation. And then here, no causation, pc to p, uh, positive regulation. pc, no regulation. p to m is uh, negative regulation. So we can recover original negative feedback loop structure uh, from this time series data. So uh, let's apply to more challenging case. Now we have uh, six time series data. And then we calculate all this uh, uh, value for each pair. You can see that there are uh, five, one and minus one, which made this five positive arrow in this diagram. And there is a one uh, negative arrow so that we can uh, again, recover this original model structure. So that based on this, uh, we made a package we call uh, IN, so inferring oscillate, oscillatory network, IOM package. And then we apply to the, some real data set. Uh, this is one of the famous synthetic oscillator called refrigerator. So their data looks like, and then they have this uh, three repression uh, structure. And then uh, when we apply our IN into this original data set, we were able to recover this uh, negative, negative, negative structure. But when we use that grandeur causality or partial uh, convergence cross mapping, uh, most recent uh, inference method, you can see that basically all of them are uh, connected so that they fail to uh, recover the original structure. And then I tried uh, this one as well. I copied the original data set and I shifted. So that now there are six time series data. So that uh, when we applied our method, we were able to get this two independent uh, repression structure. But if we use the Granger causality, you can see that basically it say that everything is connected. So that's the problem of the uh, user uh, inference method when the oscillatory time series data. And then finally, uh, we also apply to this already complex system. And again, oscillatory time series data. With our method, there are only two regulations. Uh, regulation is detected, but if we use other <laughs> previous algorithm, you can see that basically it predicts that everything is connected. Okay. So uh, here is a summary. Uh, what we did is, basically when the time series data is given, we asked the question whether this kind of ODE exists with the monotone function of F, which can reproduce this oscillatory dynamics series. If the yes, then we say there is a causation. If no, then we say that there is no causation. That's our uh, model-based uh, inference algorithm. Then of course, uh, one can ask a question, uh, may, what if uh, we generalize this model, right? So that here we only consider that uh, for the Y there is only single input, right? But there could be multiple input cases. For To answer this question, we have to sh uh, use this generalized model. And then uh, fortunately, uh, my two talented uh, students uh, were uh, success recently successfully extended our approach it to this general, most general type of ODE, so that uh, when we apply this to uh, this uh, time series data, you can see that now more uh, complex network structure can be inferred. And then, uh, for, uh, and good news is now the new method can be applied for even for non-oscillatory time series data. So any type of oscillator, uh, any type of time series data can be applied. For instance, if we apply to this uh, air pollution and cardio patient data in Hong Kong, uh, we, we were able to found that among the air pollution, uh, NO2 and this, I don't know what it is, but these two uh, air pollutants are key for the uh, cardiovascular disease in the Hong Kong population. So uh, let me summarize our talk uh, first. At the first talk, uh, we, uh, we found that um, in the circadian clock, uh, cert certainly some protein arrived to the perinucleus earlier, but they are waiting there because they cannot be phosphorylated. But they are more accumulated so that the threshold is passed. Then suddenly, majority of them are phosphorylated. And then they can enter to the nucleus. And this is the key 
to generate the strong rhythm and then uh, filtering the uh, spatiotemporal noise of this arrival times. Even arrival time is very heterogeneous due to this five stable switch, we, they can enter the nucleus at the same time. That's the first part. And then second part, uh, we've oh, uh, basically uh, from the time series data, we asked the question whether there exists a certain smooth model which can reproduce this data. Based on this question, uh, we were uh, uh, develop an inference method for the coding from the x to the y. And we uh, name it as a general model uh, based inference method. And uh, so uh, the first uh, circadian clock project is done by the Sokju Che and Dave Kim now, who is a, a Ben Nu assistant professor at University of Michigan. And then uh, the second causation project is done by uh, Seo Park and Song Min Ha. And uh, as uh, Professor Joe introduced me, I launched this uh, IBS Biomedical Mathematics Group last year. It has been a year. It's a very new center. Uh, here, basically, uh, various background people, math people, biology, and physics, and chemistry, medicine people uh, work together to solve the biological problem. And then, uh, actually, we are organizing the online colloquium series. It's a public event. So if you have interest in uh, uh, this uh, system biology or computational biology stuff, so you're more than welcome. And, and if you missed your, the talk, uh, we also have a YouTube website. You can see the, uh, our previous uh, talks. So yeah, uh, and finally, we are hiring the senior researcher and postdoctor. So if you have interest in this kind of stuff, please let me know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any question? Yes. And great talk, Jake. Yeah. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, um, if I took randomly selected intervals mm -hmm. uh, out of the time series, mm -hmm. right, and I just treated them as independent variables, except I demand that the coefficients in the functions mm -hmm. are the same between the different time intervals, uh -huh. right? Would I get the same result or not? Because uh -huh. then I'm not, I'm not claiming that I need to use the uh, fact that there is a point at which, that, right? Yeah. But at the Actually, same time, that's uh, key of our new approach. Okay. So in that way. Uh, we don't need a uh, oscillatory dynamics. So I mean, yeah. that's really what you want, right? Yeah, Regardless exactly. of the time interval, it should be the same function, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So in that way, uh, we don't need that selecting the two time points thing. So it right. was uh, that, much generic. That can yes. be quite restrictive, yes, especially yes. especially if it's a noisy system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay. Second question: Did you check the? How did you quantify the the? crowding thing, because adipocytes, when they get big, mm -hmm. unfortunately, I have a lot of uh, experience studying adipocyte sizes, and, and when mice are obese, or mm -hmm. rats, or whatever you want, basically, adipocytes are very atypical cells. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so so I, I'm just curious how you quantified crowding, because in an adipocyte that's full, Basically, all the cytoplasm is a thin sheath around a big blob of fat, right? I see, yeah. So for the adipocyte experiment, uh, the in vitro experiment, uh, because adipos we make the adipocyte is keep increasing, so th th we, are, we are pretty sure that as time goes, uh, uh, the uh, cell becomes more crowded. That was made sure, uh, pretty sure. But for the mice case, uh, it's just obesity mice, so uh, that obesity uh, cell crowd is not just by the uh, adipocyte. There could be multiple uh, things happen, but uh, unfortunately, there is a no way to actually measure the uh, cytoplasmic congestion level at this point with right. the current technique. So every reviewer actually asks us, "Can you ma can quantify this?" This, but because unfortunately, there is no way to measure it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that's just imagination. Yeah. Okay. Because mm -hmm. the. Obesity in the actual mice mm -hmm. is going to bring along with it 
all sorts of other complications mm -hmm. like local uh, inflammation, for instance, mm -hmm. and so on. So I think it would be very hard to distinguish yes. biologically what exactly is going mm -hmm. on. OK, thanks. Yes. So I have a, some naive question. In the end, you are uh, studying the dynamical systems. Mm -hmm. And and so your period, periodicity of your time trajectory, I, I, I was wondering how robust it is. And then I was wondering if you see some evidence of chaos in this, uh, in your time trajectory. Have you, have you actually tried to uh, look at the uh, uh, point car section, something like this. Uh, oh, the first one or second? No, second one. In, Se in general, I mean, you, in first one, second one, it doesn't matter actually. Uh -huh. you are anyhow, uh, uh, studying the dynamical system. I, I'm, I, I, first thing I, I want to see is the if you see the some period, but it's not perfect. Yes, yes. There are some shifts, maybe due to the noise, but uh, yeah, you yeah, look yeah. at the point car section, something like that. So, kind of. Uh, for the simulation study, yeah, we use the first perfect oscillatory series, but uh, and then we added some noise, so that uh, there is some uh, uh, kind of peak to peak is changing and the amplitude is change. But actually, the pattern uh, inference pattern doesn't change much, even when that happened. But for the real data set, uh, unfortunately, we cannot test that kind of thing because. If you look at the real data set, it's usually just two or three cycle. So there is no such long data series so that we were not able to test that kind of thing. But just what we know is not every cycle not exactly the same. So there is a slight changes. Yes. Yes. You have so uh, the result mostly for pair y uh, relationship between yeah, exactly, x and yes. y, and you also saw that the method can be extended to the case with multiple input, mm -hmm. but still like how to say just the uh, input is a superposition of uh, mm -hmm. uh, the total input is a superposition of pair y input. Can you comment on the like by on your intuitions like if you have mm. high order interaction okay. like uh, uh, yes yes. Very good questions. So let me begin with the one example. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say where is multiple input cases? Oh uh, uh, yeah, for instance, this one. Uh, this one has a two input, right? Uh, uh, let's begin one input case. Uh, for instance, this reg A has a one input, right? Then if this one, uh, first uh, this one input is true, then what happened is if I add additional things, we found that our algorithm says, oh, always there is a, a, a causation. The reason is uh, basically uh, we are testing. Um, ah, yes. Yes. So actually, this is a, actually single input cases. But let me ask this question, dy dt equal to, and this is actually yes case, and then other variable. Uh, if really x causing the y, if this multi-dimensional uh, ODE exists, then of course the answer should be yes, because all these other variable coefficient could be just a zero, right? No, but what I mean mm -mm. Is there are distinction between the direct uh, input. So oh, yeah, so direct input here. And the indirect one because you have a network system, so you have a multiple pathway going from one node to the mm -hmm. other node. So if the method is just uh, like how the method work when you have the when you need to take into account multiple pathway. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, question. And the uh, so uh, question. regarding that, uh, our algorithm uh, distinguishes the indirect and direct input. It can, it, uh, in our algorithm, indirect causation is not considered as a causation. Only this uh, algorithm detected direct causation. Mm. Yeah, thank mm. you. But still, mm. one other question is um, if you now you have a x1 to xn, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
own of some uh, have some influence on why. Mm -hmm. But what can happen is in you you have some kind of high order relationship like x1 multiply x2 multiply to x3 and the combination of. Oh, that is also okay, because x1 x2 x3 is also part of this model. This f can be any general function, so it doesn't depending on any specific form of the. Uh, regulation function. As long as it's continuous function, okay. So that's why we call it a general or the a general model-based approach rather than specific model-based approach. So it doesn't depending on it could be Hill function or Michelson function, polynomial function, sine function, whatever is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any other question? I want to ask you a second talk. So, uh, for example, for oscillatory system, uh, I think we need some continuous data. And I, I guess the required time interval for the data would be one period or several period. But however, for the non-oscillatory system, we could not determine how much time required. Yeah. So what is the uh, solution for this question? Okay. So for the first part, uh, well, of course, uh, real experimental data, uh, they are not continuous, right? So then what we did is for this discrete time point, we just interpolate it, and then we treat it as just continuous data, and then uh, it work. So that's for the first question. And then for the uh, second uh, your, uh, question, for the oscillation, we know that where we finish is, but for the non-oscillatory system, of course, if we have more and more data, it's always better. So that our second algorithm, uh, uh, what is newly added is, with the current uh, data, uh, can we tell or not? There is a what first uh, algorithm say that uh, from this data, we cannot tell anything. So, uh, so that we need more data. There is a, uh, uh, we add that part so that how much data we need to tell the uh, causation or not. So for this cases, as long as one oscillatory time series data is given, uh, we can clearly say yes or no. But for the non-oscillatory time series data, in our new project, a new algorithm, uh, we add an algorithm say that uh, current data is enough or not first, and then we, if it's enough, then we say yes or no. So that algorithm output consists of three, yes, no, not enough data set, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Oh, can... fine. Yeah. yeah. What happens if there is a time delay? <sighs> or... Yes, very good question. So that's the big issue. Uh, Currently, we assume that uh, the observed time variable at uh, the regulation is immediate. Yeah. But uh, for a certain level of the time delay, it's okay. But the problem is if the time delay is super long, then our equation is ODE equation, right? So that uh, we cannot use it. So that uh, actually our follow-up project is now we extend this to some DDE equation and then we are trying to figure out this issue. Yeah, thanks for the question, yeah. So you have another question? I like you have lots of questions. <laughs> okay, shall we stop here? Let's thank Professor Kim.